prophet Isaiah said in scripture, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. And it has been done. Let us stand and worship the risen Lord Jesus. Would you please be seated? And again, good morning and welcome to St Andrew's Cathedral here in the heart of the city, this most glorious of days when our Saviour rose. Let us pray in preparation together. Almighty God, 
to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, just before we read Jesus' great words, I realise that I omitted one thing in the pre-service notices, which because the cathedral is so full today, uh, even though it's unlikely, I think I should mention, and they're the emergency exits, just is very full. There are exits to the rear of you, to the west, to the north via the George Street exit, in emergency under the organ loft to the south, and of course behind me at the east in George Street in the unlikely event that we need them. I thought this was the best place we could do it because we were about to tell each other uh, that we love God and that we uh, love our neighbours and this is a way that I thought we should do that. So, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Lord, have mercy on us and write your commandments in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who's promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you to do his will and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Almighty God, you have conquered death through your dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. By your grace, enable us to set our minds on things above, so that by your continual help, our whole life may be transformed through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit in everlasting glory. Amen. Some of you were a little disappointed on Good Friday that we didn't have the Joseph jacket of many colors. And uh, today, my wonderful assistant is modeling it for me. Thank you, Adrian and Claire. And here we have two kinds of Easter eggs, but there's something different about them that you can't see. But you'll discover it if I put them in this bowl of water. One sinks, the other doesn't. And the difference is what's inside them. This one, the blue one that sunk, is filled with rocks. It's weighed down. A bit like the things we can do, those bad things weigh us down. And the memory of the things we should have done and failed to do, sin can weigh us down. This one, doesn't matter how much you try to push it down, it keeps on popping up to the top because, of course, it's empty. Just like Jesus' tomb on Easter Day. Jesus' tomb was empty. Friends, Jesus conquered death. He defeated sin so we can be completely forgiven by God. We can trust that Jesus' death and resurrection has completely dealt with the sin that weighs us down. So, if you're eating Easter eggs and you get one that's not hollow, remember, you don't have to be weighed down by your sin. But if you get one that's hollow, why not remember the empty tomb and thank God. Jesus removed the weight of death and sin. Trust in him and we can live forever with him as friends. Which of these eggs represents the way you might want to live your life? We have children's packs for the younger children here at the cathedral and now would be the time to raise your hand high for it and just to give our great leaders an opportunity uh, I said you could greet others with the words Christ has risen in other languages so why don't you take a brief moment to see if there's anyone around you now who can greet you in another language their heart language and if they can do so you respond with he is risen indeed Archbishop Christ has risen Keep your hand up if you want the kids pack. Don't forget to check the rear. Yep. And now, let us turn our attention to the Word of God. From 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and beginning at the first verse. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received 
and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I'm the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you've believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pilates is very popular these days. It's a core exercise thing, isn't it? Strengthen the inner muscles, essential to stability. The creed is our core exercise as Christians. And right at the heart, it focuses on the death and resurrection of Jesus for our stability. Would you take your stand? And in fellowship with Christians down through the ages and across the globe today, let us declare, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
A reading from the, jo- from the Gospel according to John, chapter 19, beginning at the 38th verse. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 35 kilograms. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. What a joy it is to meet together in this way, this Easter day, as millions of Christians will do around our nation and around the world. Christ is risen, sins forgiven, death defeated, the Spirit with us, a new world coming. Hallelujah, what a saviour. The resurrection of Jesus is described as the first fruits in the Bible, the first in the crop. Because Jesus is raised, so will we all be raised, believer and unbeliever, the faithful and the skeptic, the repentant and the unrepentant, we will all be raised, but not yet. The resurrection of all people is still ahead of us, and with it, the coming of the kingdom of God in all its fullness. Jesus is the first fruits that guarantees what is to come, the first of the crop, but there is still so much more to come. For now, we know all too well, we live with sorrow and sickness, with war and injustice, with deliberate evil and unexpected tragedy. In 2022, Palestinian Christians in Gaza were numbered at less than 1,500 and 50,000 in the West Bank and Jerusalem. Those in the West Bank have not been able to enter Jerusalem this Easter, where their countrymen walked the way of the cross on Friday with a reduced number of Easter worshippers. We cry out to God for the peace of Jerusalem, for the release of hostages held by terrorists. We weep with Israelis and with Palestinians who grieve the loss of family members and the destruction of their homes and communities through war. We cry out for those in Ukraine, Sudan, Myanmar and the Middle East who suffer from wars not of their own making and we cry out for an end to despotism, war and tyranny. We proclaim that Christ is risen and that the risen Christ is the guarantee of the day of justice on all wickedness, cruelty and violence that in this world wreaks havoc and misery. We proclaim that Christ is risen and that he is Lord and judge of all and that will, he will one day establish his kingdom where there is no more war or crying or pain and every tear will be wiped away. The news from around the world, as well as here in Australia, of tragic accidents, criminal violence, the stress experienced by so many just seeking to make ends meet and keep a roof over their heads, means we cannot by any means be content with an Easter that is merely chocolate eggs and hot cross buns and a few days off. No, Christ is risen. Evil will not triumph. Sorrow will not have the last say. And sin and death will not keep us captive forever. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth and says, this is gospel, good news of first importance, not a matter of philosophical speculation or merely personal religious interest. No, these things were according to the scriptures. That is the plan of God, God's response to a weary world broken by its rebellion against him and rejection of his word. The resurrection of Jesus is good news from God, the climax of his rescue and renovation plan for the world. 
I have three questions. What is the gospel? Can we believe it? Does it matter? What is the gospel? Paul says, here's the heart of the matter. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Three times the gospel accounts record for us the words of Jesus that he must be handed over to the chief priests and the elders. They will kill him and on the third day he will rise again. Jesus taught that his divine mission, his purpose in coming, was to die at the hands of those he came to save and to be raised again. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, Jesus said. I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. And on the night of his arrest, he said to his disciples as he handed them the cup, This is my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Is the resurrection of Jesus good news? It is. The Bible everywhere views human death not as merely a natural event, but as a penalty, divine judgment on human disobedience. But Christ died for our sins in our place as our substitute, as our representative on our behalf, bearing the penalty that we had deserved. And he was raised to show that God has a plan for forgiveness, for a new beginning, to bring blessing to a world that has turned away from him, to renew the whole creation and to wipe away every tear. For now we live with decay and death, destruction and disease, but the resurrection has put them all on notice. Death has a use-by date because Jesus died for sin and was raised again. The good news is that God is fulfilling his plan to ransom those captive to death to bring home his lost sons and daughters, to forgive sinners and adopt rebels and orphans into his own family, to renew the whole creation and free it from sin and sickness and death. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul says, this is the gospel I preach to you. This is the gospel you received and in which you now stand. And this is the gospel by which you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Trust in this, trust in Jesus, gospel. Second, can we believe it? Along with the climactic events in the life of Jesus, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Along with these climactic events, Paul mentions two supporting facts which point to their historicity. He was buried. We know where they laid him. No one denied the tomb was empty. He appeared to Peter to the 12, to 500 others, to James and to Paul. Let's consider this information purely as a matter of history for a moment. Tiberius was Caesar when Jesus was crucified. The Roman historian Tacitus wrote his account of the life of Tiberius about 80 years after the death of the emperor. And that is regarded by ancient historians unequivocally as a reliable historical account. But historians similarly view these four statements in verses 3 3 to 5 of our reading from 1 Corinthians 15, these four statements that Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, 
that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared. Historians regard these as an excerpt from a longer, earlier Christian creed. That is, Paul didn't write these words. He's using words that were already in circulation. He wrote them to the Corinthian church in the mid-50s AD, 25 to 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. But he says, this is what he himself received, verse 3 says, which must be a reference to his visits to the Jerusalem church in the mid-30s, a year or two after his conversion. In other words, these words are evidence that the essential truths of the new movement around Jesus were widely agreed and circulated very rapidly after the first Easter. Within a couple of years, these facts were established and accepted. They were not stories that developed over time and became more elaborate with the passage of time. From the beginning, it was proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, that he died for our sins, was buried, raised, and appeared. It's not unreasonable, of course, to be skeptical about the resurrection. Though we sometimes think of first century people as gullible and naive because they didn't have access to Wikipedia. They were, in fact, much more familiar with death than we are. They knew death close up, and they knew dead men didn't rise. The idea that Jesus didn't really die, but only fainted and recovered in the cool of the tomb, requires us to believe that when Jesus revived from the agony of crucifixion, he rolled away the stone from the inside, overcame the Roman guard, and when he appeared to the 12 who were hiding in fear of their lives and showed them his nail-pierced hands and feet and his pierced side, they thought he was the Lord of life who had conquered death and devoted the rest of their lives to proclaiming this message, even at the expense of their own lives. The New Testament records for us that all the disciples, and not just doubting Thomas, doubted when they first heard the report that Jesus was alive. But they were all convinced, not by some inner light of revelation, but because they saw him, they ate with him, they talked to him, and they learned from him. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is, of course, an unprecedented event in human history. But the relative simplicity and straightforwardness of the accounts of the resurrection continue to have power because no one can deny that something happened. The preaching of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead irrevocably altered the course of world history. Jesus left no instruction manual, no army, no strategic plan. Yet the group of disciples who took up the message that Jesus was raised from the dead, Lord and judge of humanity, worthy to be worshiped as God in the flesh, according to their own enemies, turned the world upside down, despite the fact that they were themselves, for the most part, ordinary men and women with no claim to religious authority or military power or political influence or economic resources. Something profoundly and permanently changed them so that global history continues to feel their impact. The first believers in the resurrection changed their attitude to the nature and worship of God, to personal morality, government, war, welfare, work, marriage, and the future within weeks. 
the social and political effects of the early Christian movement were so dramatic, widespread and enduring that Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge, the late CFD Moll, said, there is a resurrection-shaped hole in history that remains an enigma for any historian who does not take seriously the explanation found in the New Testament. Two non-Christian historians, Ed Sanders, says it is utterly implausible that the New Testament testimony of the resurrection is a deliberate fraud, and he considers it a fact that the apostles experienced the risen Jesus, though he declines to draw any significance from that. Giza Vermesh, a Jewish historian of the resurrection, says the tomb was most probably empty, and it is virtually certain that the apostles believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. Something profoundly and permanently changed them so that we continue to feel their impact. They said it was that Jesus had been raised from the dead. What do you think it was? Gospel. We can believe it. Third, does it matter? Paul makes the point that Jesus appeared to Peter and the Twelve, to James and the other apostles, to 500 brothers and sisters, and to Paul himself. About Jesus' appearance to himself, Paul says this in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, and do not deserve even to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. The death and resurrection of Jesus were events in history, but the resurrection of Jesus is not only to be thought of as objective and historical. It is not less than that, but it is more. It is also intensely personal. Paul, Paul mentions Peter by name, for it was Peter, Kephas, who had so bitterly deserted and denied his Lord. Jesus appears to him, and John records the poignant account of their reconciliation in John 20, 21. James, Jesus' half-brother, Mark's Gospel tells us, at the time of Jesus' public ministry, James sought to take him into custody, calling him insane. And John tells us bluntly, James did not believe. Jesus appears to him, and he becomes leader of the church in Jerusalem, which was no great honour. The Jewish historian for the Roman Empire, Josephus, records that James was executed by Caesar in AD 62 for his faith. And Paul, the persecutor turned preacher, the sworn enemy of Jesus, turned into the humble servant of Jesus. How can this be? Such welcome, such affirmation, such care and kindness towards those who betrayed Jesus, belittled and blasphemed against him. Paul has a word for it, grace. It is the character of the gospel, what Jesus has done, dying for sin, being raised as victor over death. What Jesus has done, he has done for the undeserving and he offers it freely by his grace. Forgiveness of sin, freedom from guilt, fearlessness in the face of death, life with God now and eternally. This is the offer of the gospel. And the grace of Jesus for forgiveness and adoption has been welcomed by millions and millions since those first believers began to preach that Christ 
was risen from the dead. Tim Costello, former CEO of World Vision, speaking of his own faith, says this, if you really believe in the resurrection, it frees you to take risks now. You do not have to have every experience, every pay rise and career promotion, and squeeze everything into this one life. There is another life, and you can live vulnerably, sacrificially for others. Dear friends, the risen Jesus says to us on this day of all days, have we turned from self-rule, from self-promotion, from self-obsession? If you know you have not yielded to God his rightful place in your life as the author of your life, having appointed Jesus judge of all humankind before whom we will all appear, if you know you have not yielded to the one who made you and loves you, Easter is a wonderful time to yield. Chances are you believe you matter. God agrees. Death denies it. The resurrection affirms that you matter. Turn to Christ and live. Let us turn from sin, from fear and guilt and shame and self. The Bible says, why would you die? Turn to Christ and live. Easter is precious because it is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that confirms that everything matters. The suffering of those displaced by war or brutalized by corrupt regimes, the woman who seeks refuge for herself and her children, the family that grieves the sudden death of a child, all of it matters. We are not just atoms plus time plus chance. The death of Jesus for our sake says, our moral choices matter. And the resurrection of Jesus says, there is a day of resurrection, which is also a day of judgment. Justice matters, kindness matters, you matter, and the decisions we make matter, especially the decision we make about God and life and death and eternity. Paul says he preached this gospel to them. They received it. Now they stand in it and they will be saved by it if they hold firm. There is news of what God has done and there is receiving it, standing on it, holding firm to what God has done. The gospel is news to be trusted. Jesus is the Lord of life and judge of all. Have you put your trust in him? He is worthy to be trusted with your sins and fears, with your hopes and dreams, with your life and death. Have you trusted in Jesus? If you wish to, you could pray the prayer that is printed on the inside cover of your order of service. I'm going to pray it now, and you may wish to do so as well for the first time or all over again in your heart to God on the inside cover at the bottom of the page. Let me pray. Dear God, I know that I am not worthy to be accepted by you. I am guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me, paying my debt, bearing my punishment, that I may be forgiven. Please forgive me and change me 
that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus is good news according to the scriptures. Good news from God. Good news to a world steeped in sin and sorrow. Hear the good news. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you, Kanishka. Our next hymn is perhaps the most loved of those written in the 21st century. Will you stand and sing out with me?
Would you please be seated as four of our cathedral leaders lead us in prayer. First prayer this morning at Easter 2024 is for peace. Let us all pray. God of the nations, your kingdom rules over all. Please have mercy on our broken and divided world. We beg your mercy, especially for Israel and Gaza, the Ukraine, for Sudan, Haiti, Myanmar, Yemen, and other places of war and civil strife, along with religions and regions where jihadist terrorists and kidnappings take place. And we pray too for areas of afflict that are afflicted by anti-religious persecution and discrimination. Restrain the wickedness of those who stir up conflict. Instead, we pray for those working for peace and justice and for the relief of the injured, displaced, disadvantaged, hungry and grieving. Heavenly Father, shed abroad your peace in the hearts of all races and people that they might learn to live as members of one human family, above all, through coming to know Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Let's pray for the needy. Most merciful Father, we humbly ask you to remember the homeless, the destitute, the sick, the aged, the depressed, the lonely, refugees and prisoners, and all who have none to care for them. We pray for King Charles, the Princess of Wales, and all being treated for cancer. Heal those who are broken in body or spirit and turn their sorrow into joy. Strengthen all those who seek to serve them, especially our new community chaplaincy initiative, and help us take every opportunity to minister to the needs of others. For the love of your Son, Jesus our Saviour. Amen. A prayer for all during this holiday period. O oh God, our rest and our redeemer, we give you thanks that in the course of this busy life, you give us times of relaxation, reflection, and peace. Bless those we love from whom we are separated at present. Especially we pray for all who travel over this long weekend, watch over them and protect them from any danger. Please strengthen those, who, those required to work over Easter, especially the police and emergency services. And refresh those who have holidays, that we may live in harmony with you and your creation. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. An Easter prayer. Glorious Lord of life, by the mighty resurrection of your Son, you overcame the old order of sin and death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. We celebrate with joy Christ's rising from the dead and thank you for all who have testified to the reality that Jesus is alive. Grant that having been raised from the death of sin, we might live the life of righteousness as we follow Jesus. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Again, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat the bread and drink from the cup. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your boundless goodness and mercy. We are not even worthy to eat the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, always rich in mercy. Enable us by faith to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may be cleansed from sin and forever dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Always and everywhere, it is right for us to praise you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator and eternal God. We praise you especially for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the true Passover Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. By his rising to life again, he has restored to us eternal life. Therefore, with all those gathered around your throne in heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name in words of never-ending praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, Lord Most High. We thank you, Father, that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who eat and drink them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, believing our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. To Jesus Christ, who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Come, let us eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Brothers and sisters, you'll see that the instructions for receiving communion are on the next page, and you may quickly wish to survey those. There will be a fifth station to the rear.
Lord and loving Heavenly Father, in your loving kindness, accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his suffering. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just uh, before we wrap up, it's been tremendous to have the cathedral so full and uh, I trust that as uh, the distribution occurred, you had a chance to be thinking of and perhaps praying for ones dear to you. Uh, you may discover after the service is over that there's someone wandering around offering you an Easter egg and we wish you well and we invite you back. Uh, if you don't have a church of your own, try the cathedral here in the heart of the Sydney every Sunday. And if it's been a long time since you have read one of the Gospels accounts of Jesus as an adult, please take a paperback copy of The Essential Jesus. It's a modern translation of the Gospel of Luke and what a good way it would be to spend the Easter weekend rereading that gospel as an adult for your own spiritual refreshment. You can see all the information about our cathedral and the things that are on here on the back pages and how you can be involved and support what's going on. Let us now stand and sing our concluding hymn. resurrected son.
the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.